All right, um, if you click play, this is the first thing you're gonna see. Let me um, just give you a, a minute or two about the video that I prepared here. It's long, it's uh, 50, 55 minutes long. There's a lot of detail in there. Um, I encourage you to watch it all the way through. If you're managing your own money, uh, if you're a retail trader with your own account, I encourage you to listen to the whole thing. Uh, it is long, but you're going to learn a lot. Uh, so uh, I won't keep you too long in this introduction. I just wanted to prepare you for how long this was, but I, I spent a lot of time on it and I'm imparting a lot of good structure and knowledge. Uh, so uh, just, you know, stick with it. And I think by the time you get to the end, you'll be happy that you watched it. Ciao. Well, I'm back, still waiting for a haircut, still waiting for a time where I can go in without having to wear a hazmat suit just to get a haircut. So I'll wait. Anyways, earlier in the week, I had put a video out. Uh, and in the end, I said that uh, I would put uh, another one out talking about uh, how I uh, manage um, my positions and how I think about the market on a day to day basis. Uh, how do I position myself depending on what's going on and for the most part I, I don't really anticipate too much in terms of what I'm going to do I let the market tell me what I'm going to do based on where it's headed uh, I'm just prepared to go one way or another depending on what happens so I'm going to show you uh, how I think about that with uh, some examples of some things that I do and again, let me say up front, uh, the things that I talk about are not recommendations. Uh, I'm trying to apply concepts from the readings uh, at all three levels of CFIA to the real world. And in doing that, I'm using real world examples, uh, things that I do, but it by no means is, is, am I saying everybody run out and do this stuff. I'm just showing you an application uh, of something. So. Uh, let me start off with uh, um, a little bit of commentary uh, about uh, a post that was on LinkedIn that I had responded to uh, concerning institutional versus retail uh, investors, and it was about Robin Hood uh, traders and Robin Hood investors. Um, and I had made the point that you, you really can't compare <clears throat> a retail account with an institutional account. Uh, they have different environments that they operate under the institutional account faces a lot of constraints so a big one being size it simply can't move as fast as a retail trader it can't take advantage of small opportunities that retail traders can and on the other side of that a lot of these things you do in retail accounts they don't scale very well so there's a lot of things I do and some of the things that I'm going to show you that if I were managing a 500 million dollar or 1 billion dollar uh, um, fund I couldn't do these things. <clears throat> I couldn't do them in enough scale that would matter to a fund that big without completely destroying the opportunity uh, by moving the price. So a retail account actually has quite a few advantages over an institutional account in what it can do and get away with while staying under the radar, while not leaving big footprints. So it can take advantage of these small opportunities. Uh, so <clears throat> I had uh, said, think about it in, in a two by two grid and we'll draw a two by two grid out and you have the retail account and you have an institutional account and CFAI, all the content at CFAI is really aimed at the institutional account. At level three, we start to see some wealth management, uh, but the tools and the structure we bring to wealth management really is uh, more from the institutional side. The way we think about constructing portfolios, for example, uh, has a lot of discipline and a lot of structure to it. Uh, there's not a lot that's focused really just on a retail trader managing their own account. Uh, but I will say that the concepts and the tools you learn, if you bring that to the retail account, it's very powerful. So we can think of retail uh, and institutional accounts. You can think of uh, the uh, individuals as being experienced uh, and inexperienced. Uh, for the institutional account, uh, there is nothing in that particular cell. You're not going to get to an institutional level without experience. Uh, if you are brand new to this right out of the gate, you have uh, no experience behind you, it's doubtful uh, that you're going to be managing money on any scale at all. Um, 
and uh, especially if you lack the proper educational background for it, you're not getting in there. For the retail investor, there is no hurdle. Uh, anybody can open an account and Robinhood shows that you can do this and it levers you up, which I find to be absolutely irresponsible that it takes uh, no steps in determining whether or not you belong in this space at all. <clears throat> maybe that's just democracy and maybe that's just freedom at work saying, I get to do what I want. If I want to make stupid decisions, I'm allowed to make stupid decisions. Uh, we'll leave that debate for another day. But uh, for the retail trader, you can have retail traders with lots of experience and with inexperience. Uh, these ones disappear. And this is the majority of your retail uh, accounts are uh, inexperienced. They will, they will disappear over time. Um, the history of these accounts. Uh, and there's lots of research. Uh, if you look in some of the finance journals, there's lots of research looking at retail accounts uh, across some of the discount brokerage firms uh, and what happens to them over time. Uh, and especially in the field of behavioral finance uh, and, and how these accounts uh, are, are managed where they display a lot of herding behavior, which is very typical in retail accounts because retail traders tend to headline hunt what's in the headlines, and then they just indiscriminately buy, and they buy on headlines. Uh, they pay attention to information that confirms uh, that they're doing the right thing, even though there could be a bunch of negative stuff, <clears throat> and one thing that says you're right, that's what they'll focus on. Uh, they are loss averse, which means they hold on to their losers longer than they need to. Uh, <clears throat> they're not diversified. They tend to make big concentrated bets. They're either all in or all out at the same time. I'll buy this, I'll sell this, as opposed to lightening up or increasing. So they're very inexperienced. They will gain experience over time, but it's going to be really, really expensive if they have enough capital to stay in the game long term. And we're already seeing uh, uh, some headlines coming out of uh, the retail space about the effects that it can have on people when they do lose. Um, listen, if you are investing your money thinking that, look, I can double this in a month, you must also accept the fact that you can lose half in a month because you cannot have one side of the distribution. Uh, that just doesn't work in the real world. If there is the possibility of the right tail in the distribution, you have to accept the possibility of the left tail. Uh, you can't flip a coin and both sides are heads all the time and you get to bet heads all the time. Uh, it's 50-50, heads or tails. If you're betting on the flip of a coin, yeah, you can double your money, but you can lose it. Same thing uh, with these retail accounts. If you're going all in on one particular stock because you think you can double your money, you have to accept the fact that you can, that you can have your money in the same period of time. Uh, there are two sides to that distribution, but the retail trader tends to focus on uh, you know, what return they're going to get and they um, focus less on, if they focus on it at all, about the risks that they're taking on and what they're getting paid to take on those risks. Uh, for uh, a retail account which brings education and experience, uh, it is not difficult to outperform a broad market index year after year after year it, it, and do it consistently because again, you can take advantage of small inefficiencies uh, that a larger account simply can't take advantage of. Uh, let me give you an example of an inefficiency sitting in the market right now that has at its lowest amount uh, an annualized return of about 25%. At its highest it has an annualized return of 65%. And I can't understand why this inefficiency exists, yet it exists. So I'll give you a quick example of, of, of this inefficiency. Uh, and, uh, you know, full disclosure, I have about 100,000 shares in this, in this uh, company right now because, because of this. I see it every day. I go, I, I can't just let it sit there. Uh, Northview Apartment REIT, NVU, um, has uh, been uh, purchased uh, for thirty six twenty five a share by, um, two, uh, by two funds, Starlight and Kingset. Um, it's a done deal, basically. My account has tracking stock. I no longer have the stock, I have tracking stock. I can't trade it anymore. I can't trade in or trade out of that. Now I can still trade publicly the shares that are uh, happening, but since I have made my election for what I wanna receive, because all shareholders had to make their election, 
Uh, I've elected what I wanted to receive. Those shares were removed and tracking stock was put in. That's a done deal. It's over. Uh, they've gotten shareholder approval for the deal. Those who have elected have tracking stock. The uh, court said, yeah, we're okay with all of this. Uh, they've announced, already announced, the, uh, the uh, structure of what the notes are going to look like that, that they're going to issue and who the investors in the notes are at this point in time. You've had big insider purchases of six, seven million uh, shares a month for the last three months. It's a done deal. Now, this is going to close sometime in the third quarter. The third quarter is anywhere from July uh, 2nd to September 30th. And they've already announced the, uh, the, the June dividend, so it's going to happen in July. The stock is $34.45. It's $1.80 below its takeout price. Uh, plus the one dividend is $13.58 on the dividend. You've got $1.93, uh, $93.58 minimum per share. Uh, and it can close as early as July 2nd because it's going to be sometime in the third quarter. And everything is lined up. I can't see it lasting till September. I hope it does because that means more dividends. Uh, but it's it's a takeout at 34 and a quarter. The problem is, and and the reason a larger fund could never take advantage of this opportunity, is that because of this, because of the tracking stock being placed in in uh, in different accounts, so a whole bunch of shares are are basically off the market. The average trading volume per day is super, super low. Hardly anyone's trading in or out of this thing at this point in time. So there's no demand to push this thing up. So if you put a bid in at 34.45, 34.50 and you wait, it takes, a, it takes a while to get filled. Ding, ding. You'll get filled over the course of the day. So I have uh, 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 on weekdays when I see it, um, you know, sort of pushing down, I buy. Uh, now, if I were a large fund and I said, for me to take advantage of this, I need two, three, four million shares. There's no way that I'm going to capture a dollar eighty because when I start buying, being that the average daily volume now is maybe a hundred thousand shares, fifty to a hundred thousand shares, I'm going to close that gap in no time. It's not worth it for me to do it, but for me, it's worth it for a small instant, a small retail trader. That's an inefficiency that's absolutely worth grabbing that you couldn't do at scale because you would destroy the very opportunity you were trying to take advantage of. All you could do is put a bid at 34.50 and wait to get hit. But uh, 34.50 seems to be the line where everyone's putting their bid to get hit. So there we are. But there's a massive inefficiency sitting right there. Uh, you buy at 34.45, you're going to get 36.25 sometime between July 2nd and September 30th. It's it's guaranteed. At this point, backing out of this would be massive class action lawsuits because you put tracking stock into into uh, uh, accounts that you can't trade out of. So to announce that you're not going to do the deal, and you have all these accounts that simply cannot trade out at that point in time that would just lose, that'd be massive class action lawsuits. This is, this is a done deal. Uh, so that's an inefficiency, a good example of an inefficiency that a, an experienced retail trader can take advantage of. This is not in the headlines. Uh, probably most inexperienced retail traders aren't even aware that this exists. Uh, and when I get to um, the uh, structure of my portfolio, I'll explain why I see this opportunity and perhaps many, many other people don't see this opportunity. Uh, so. Let's, uh, let's push on. Okay, so in the top corner up here with this big uh, square that I've drawn with a whole bunch of different slices in there, think of that as, as my overall portfolio. Uh, first thing first is what is my goal? Right there, income and growth. Have a goal. Uh, if you have no goal, then anything seems like an opportunity for you, but you have to have a reason for being. What is your goal? My goal is to generate income and growth in my portfolio income first growth second if you're 25 well, you don't need your portfolio to provide income you're probably more growth oriented if you're treating this like a business if you're saying look i'm going to earn a living uh, doing this then yeah income is number one and if you are going to treat it like a business treat it like a business you would never open a business and then buy and sell and buy and sell your business every single day and when I ask people, you know, instead of putting your money, you got 100000 that you put in the market, why not just open a business? Well, they all of a sudden, they're very aware of all the risks of opening a business. 
but they don't bring that same logic to buying a business. And it puzzles me is, well, why would you see all the risks of a business here, but if your money is over here, you don't, you don't think about any of the risks of those businesses? Well, what happened? And there's just so many people who treat the market like a casino. Uh, that it is just a casino that's open during the course of the day. They're sitting at home. There's nothing to do. Let's go to the casino. Or they treat it like a game. Uh, and it's a business like any other business. If you treat it like a business, you can do quite well. Anyways, income and growth. Uh, so I have different layers to my portfolio. I mostly play in the REIT space. And for REITs, I'll earn, I get my exposure to the market. And that's where I uh, earn alpha. Alpha is your uh, return above uh, the required rate of return or above uh, what would be considered a normal return. Uh, I use the SPY uh, to gain more market exposure if I want and I get my diversification with the SPY because I have a, uh, a diversified large cap portfolio all of a sudden. I don't have to worry about picking. If the market's going up and I want some beta exposure, I can always add some beta exposure with SPY. And then for everything else, I use ETFs. So I take a very passive approach to my market exposure, and I take a very passive approach to everything else. I only uh, take an active approach uh, in the REIT space. And uh, very simple. You are never, ever going to be an expert in everything. If you try, you're going to be a generalist. And a generalist is not going to spot all the little opportunities in each and every sector. You're going to be looking for big themes. Always with, uh, 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 you know, what tends to be moving this way or that way. And if you're looking for big themes, you can get a lot of that uh, with passive exposure. No need to go active. And for uh, a lot of retail accounts out there, if you look at what your return is adjusted for the risk that you're taking, you're probably massively underperforming, massively underperforming. You just don't know it because you don't know the right measurements. Uh, you can do, for many retail accounts, I'm absolutely certain that if they moved away from active to passive exposure, you probably would do a lot better. Get passive exposure to what you think is going on and get away from the screen. Come back to it every couple of days and have a look you will do so much better. Uh, I'm absolutely certain of that. Anyway, so I get a whole bunch of passive exposure from ETFs. So I have ETFs with, which have bond exposure, high yield. And the reason I have high yield is because I have exposure to mortgage REITs, mostly agency mortgage REITs, which gives, gives me my investment grade return. So I don't really need more investment grade exposure. With bond exposure, I'll go to high yield. And the high yield that I get is if you look at uh, um, investment grade and high yield, I go for the top sliver of high yield, way up here, just sitting below investment grade. Uh, and the uh, ETFs uh, that I have exposure to look to buy uh, particular issues in that top uh, rung that have a probability of being upgraded into investment grade. Uh, so it comes with a nice dividend yield. You have interest rate risk associated with that. You also have economic growth risk with it because high yield will move with the economy as well. Uh, preferred shares, I have ETFs that track preferred shares uh, as well and anything else that I find interesting. Uh, I may, uh, I, I can recall a few years ago, uh, I thought that uh, corn, wheat, and soybean was priced a little too low because it was really high. It came down and I thought, well, you know, we keep having these really, really hot summers. Uh, yields are going to continue to drop. So there are ETFs that give you exposure to the ag sector. There are ETFs that give you exposure to different, uh, to different metals, uh, GLD for gold, SLV for silver. You like oil, there's USO. You like the oil services company, there's OIH. If you want uh, 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 passive exposure to the REIT sector, there's IYR, there's SRET. If you want high dividend, there are ETFs all over the place. I encourage you to look at ETFs for, for the areas where you don't have experience in or expertise, but you have a broad theme. Uh, so I have broad themes. I, I was always a top-down investor, a macro investor. Uh, so I have very broad themes, but I'm not going to be a picker. I'm not going to go in and pick winners and losers. I'm just going to get that exposure through the ETF. It's passive exposure. I'm good with that. Um, you will, uh, I, again, going back to this, this idea of expertise, um, you will only really truly become an expert in one sector, maybe two. And it takes years and years and years in that sector to really become an expert. 
I could have chosen any sector. I just happened to cho choose the REIT sector. Uh, and in, in, as time goes on, you learn about more companies. You learn about what they do, their strengths, their weaknesses, how their stock responds, the type of clientele in their stock. That's important. You can take two different REITs uh, or two companies in the same sector. Uh, and watch their price movement and you'll get the feeling right away that there's a different group of investors in these stocks. Uh, so you end up knowing the stock, you end up knowing how it moves, what it's going to respond to, you know who management is, uh, you know who's moving from one company to another, you know who's moving into sectors where they have no experience. You know so much about that sector that you can spot opportunity way before anyone else can. There is opportunity everywhere out there. Uh, but you are not going to see opportunity. You're blind to opportunity until you're prepared to see it. And you become prepared to see opportunity by becoming an expert in a particular domain. The more and more you know about a domain, about a particular sector or industry, the more you can spot the opportunity in that industry. If you're going to be an active investor, pick a sector. Pick a sector and make that your life. Pick something that you like. Pick something that appeals to you. You like retail? Fine. You like hospitality? Fine. It doesn't matter what sector, no matter what's going on in the business cycle, there are always ways to make an absolute return. There are always ways to make money. And that's where experience and education come in. You bring in education in the, in the types of strategies that you can use. You bring experience in, in deep knowledge of a particular sector. Bring those two together. There you go. You don't need to find stocks that are going to skyrocket to make money. I can make money on stocks that go sideways. You're probably thinking, how is that even possible? If you give me a bunch of stocks, you give me a sector where that sector is, is expected to show no performance at all, well, inside there's going to be some movement. That's all I need. That's all I need. As long as I have options on those, it can go sideways forever. If there's a dividend yield on that, I'm good. I'm great. Uh, so you're not going to see these opportunities if you're all over the place. Uh, so I should buy silver. Somebody said to buy silver. Somebody said this company. I'm going to buy some of this. I'm going to buy some of that. This is a really hot name right now. Maybe I'll buy some shares of Hertz. Everyone's buying Hertz. They can't be wrong. The company itself came out and said to the SEC, our stock is going to be worthless. We have no idea why people are buying this. When the company itself is saying, look, the stock is going to be worthless and it goes up. Come on, these aren't smart people. These aren't institutional investors going, we don't believe you. We don't believe you. Management is saying the company is worthless. We don't believe them. Come, what more do you need, right? Uh, so anyways, think about uh, what you want to do actively and think about what you want passive exposure to. There is nothing wrong with passive exposure to a sector. You're getting diversification and professional management right away. Well, I don't know if you call it professional management. ETFs aren't really managed so much as they're just structured, uh, but you're getting very low fees and you're getting diversification to a sector or to a theme. There's lots of ETFs. I would, I would encourage you to do that and focus on one sector that you can be an expert on. All right. So there we go. Let's look deeper into um, what's going on in uh, the REIT space uh, that I uh, that I follow, uh, and then I'll show you how I structure uh, my trading around what the market is doing. I don't I don't chase the market. Uh, I let the market tell me what I want to do, and I know what I'm going to do when it gets to wherever I think it's going to get to, or wherever it ends up going. Uh, for REITs, uh, apartment, office, storage, and industrial. Uh, I think are uh, where I want to be. Not really uh, uh, bullish on a lot of retail right now, but I don't see that it's going away, uh, especially good locations. Uh, and hospitality, I, I, I wouldn't touch. Uh, these are uh, REITs that have hotels, motels, things like that. I, I don't think I would touch any of those right now. Uh, and then, of course, the M REITs, mortgage REITs uh, that are primarily uh, um, uh, exposure to uh, agency mortgages great income potential and if they have options great way to to almost double the dividend yield that you're going to get a good mortgage REIT you can earn 20 percent a year on even if it doesn't move even if it only goes up five or six percent a year if it has a dividend yield and it has options you can get to 20 percent a year uh, 
Large players can't get that because they would end up moving the price of things too much. They would destroy it. That's where the retail uh, uh, investor can come in is it can take advantage of these little uh, uh, inefficiencies that large players can. So uh, here's what I do. Uh, think of this as the market. Uh, rather than me forecasting the market and saying, I think the market's going up, let me position myself this way. Uh, I wait for the market to go up. And I say, how will I respond when the market goes up? I wait for the market go to go down. And I say, how will I respond when the market goes down? And I know how I'm going to respond when it goes up. And I know how it's going to respond when it goes down. The day starts. I just let it do what it's going to do. So as I do this, it's Sunday uh, in the morning. Uh, Globex uh, futures market doesn't open for another uh, eight, nine hours. Uh, six o'clock tonight, we're going to get the first view on what futures are going to look like or what what that side of the world thinks that American futures are going to look like. But uh, I have found that a lot of that is meaningless because when Americans show up at seven, eight o'clock in the morning, uh, the whole thing just changes. So we really don't really get a picture till the morning. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, I can see uh, over the weekend that a record number of, of uh, uh, virus cases have been reported in the U.S. That should do something. Uh, but a record number of testing has been done. So uh, are the reported cases a result of testing and finding cases that never would have existed before? And that's really just uh, the numbers, the increased numbers are really just uh, a, an artifact of the increased testing? Or is it a result of increased social interaction? Because you have increased testing and increased social interaction, you have increased virus cases. Well, which one is it? You know, is it a combination of all of them? Is it mostly testing and social interaction isn't really uh, going to be an issue? Or is it a lot of social interaction creates a lot of new cases? I don't know. Uh, how's the market going to interpret it? I don't know. I don't care. I'll wait to find out. Uh, if it's a down day, I know exactly what I'm going to do. If it's an up day, I know what I'm going to do. So um, when we have these big down days, uh, I look to sell puts. That's what I'm going to do today. Okay, I'm in the business of selling puts today. Uh, and then it's a matter of, well, what do I want to sell puts on? What strike price do I want? What premiums am I looking for? And I'll show you on the next screen how I think about that. If the market is uh, uh, going up and I think, you know, this, this just doesn't feel right. It feels a little unwarranted. We've gone too far too fast. Maybe I want to lighten up or maybe I want to sell some calls above uh, where my stock positions happen to be for some extra premium. Uh, when I'm up here, when the market is up here, this is where I would say it's not time. I wouldn't sell. I would reduce my beta exposure on what's called dollar beta. Uh, and what does this mean? <clears throat> I find it a lot more effective to measure a portfolio's dollar beta than to look at the beta of your positions. Because you may say, well, when the market's at a top, I'm going to lighten up. I'll sell some of this and I'll sell some of this and this. And you may be selling very low beta stocks. Uh, which really kind of hurts you because if the market drops, those stocks would have dropped less than the market and outperformed on the way down. But then you kept the high beta stock. So if you look at dollar beta, then you could determine, well, you know, I have so much dollar beta, I want to bring my dollar beta here. And it doesn't matter where you get your dollar beta. If you have low beta stocks, you're just going to have to sell more of them. That's all. So if you think in terms of dollar beta, uh, it helps out a lot. To get uh, to add extra beta, I already have beta because uh, I have exposure to REITs. So this gives me exposure to the broad market factor and REITs give me exposure to real estate, give me exposure to interest rates through uh, the M REITs and it gives me exposure uh, to uh, economic growth. So I have a lot of, oh, and inflation as well. If inflation really starts to take off, property values uh, increase, tend to increase at the rate of inflation. So do rents tend to increase at the rate of inflation. Uh, and then I use SPY if I want to add more beta. And usually at the bottom of a cycle is when you want to load up on beta. At the top of a cycle is when you want to decrease your beta or pull back on the amount of beta that you have. There is a belief that, uh, you know, you want to rotate, uh, you know, when the market gets to the top, you want to rotate out of stocks into bonds. That's not necessarily true. Uh, at the top of the market, what you want to do is you want to decrease your dollar beta. And that could simply mean I'm going to sell some high beta stocks and I'm going to buy more of the low beta stocks because I want to keep the income yield. But if I go to low beta and the market drops and I have a beta lower than the market, yeah, I'll drop, but I'll outperform on the downside. The high beta stocks will really drop. Well, guess what I'll be selling puts on? right so it's not really all in all out it's a matter of well 
my exposure to the market, do I want to increase it or decrease it, depending on where the market goes. And that's what, uh, uh, dr you know, uh, if the market is dropping, I tend to want to increase my exposure to it the lower it gets. As the market is rising, I want to decrease my exposure to it. It's the opposite of momentum. Uh, you could call it uh, contrarian in that respect, but it's the opposite of momentum. Most retail accounts are momentum driven, uh, which means as the market's rising, they want to increase their exposure to the market as the market is rising. Uh, and, you know, that's a wave that you can ride and look good for a period of time, but all waves break. All waves break. And if you are a momentum trader and you don't know when momentum is over, you're done. All right, so let's uh, look at what I'm going to do. Let's say Monday opens and it's a down day, which, you know, here's the thing. For what I do, down days are just as exciting as up days because down days allow me to, to, to sell puts on stuff that I would want to own but also generate premium as well. Uh, up days are good because I can cash out on positions that have gone up for a period of time. I can sell calls, I can line up. It doesn't matter which way it goes, I'm prepared. So a down day for me, if I see red ink in the morning, I think this is gonna be good, it's gonna be a great day. If it's green ink across the screen, I think this is gonna be good, it's gonna be a great day. Isn't that a nice place to be? that it doesn't matter how the market opens up, you've structured your portfolio and you have strategies in place that it doesn't matter which way the market goes, you're going to have a good day. Well, not all days are good days. You know, you have the value of your account. Some people look at the value of their account. If it's going up or down, up or down, their emotions go with it. I don't look at that. I look at the income that I'm generating. Is my income stable or growing over time? That's what I look at. Think of owning a house that you're renting out and you're renting and you have a long-term rental on that house it's a company that's renting it they're going to rent it for 10 years they're going to give you $2,500 a month and you think well okay great I get $2,500 a month uh, and every week the real estate agent comes to see you and says your house is only worth this much today your house is worth this much your house is worth this your house is worth this your house is worth this now it's worth this now it's worth this would you buy and sell every day every day or would you say I don't really care I'm in this for the income. I got a 10 year contract on this. I'm getting $2,500 a month and maybe you have an inflation escalator in there. Would you care about the fluctuation in the price of the house or would you care about the consistency of the income that you're making? I think most people would say manage the cash flow. Manage the cash flow. The business will take care of itself. It's the same with the portfolio. Manage your cash flow. Don't worry every day that these things are hopping up and down in price. That's what they do. When they drop down in price, buy more, buy more. Uh, if they go up in price, lighten up. But what I do is I try to manage that income stream that I have. So I look at how much money my money is making because that's what my money has to do. My money's gonna work for me, I'm not gonna work for my money. Well, when it goes out, what's its salary? What is my money salary? And I look at that salary per year and I say, okay, well, every year I want an increase in salary and my money is going to earn a living. And of course, it's my salary, right? If you had a job that was $90,000 a year, uh, you know, would it matter really what's going on with the company if your job was secure? Company's doing great this month. Company's not doing too great this month. You got your income. You are working for your income. Well, my money has an income as well. So I think about it that way. All right, so let's, uh, let's get to this. The market's down. When the market's down, there's a couple things that are gonna happen. Volatility is gonna increase. Prices are dropping and volatility is gonna increase. That's beautiful for, for, for uh, premiums. Put premiums increase. Put premiums increase in two ways. Number one, you have the underlying dropping. So the inputs uh, to an option pricing model, two of the inputs are the underlying price and volatility. So as the underlying price is dropping, that increases the value of the put. So as the underlying price drops, the put value increases. As volatility increases, the put increases even more. So you're getting a double benefit out of the premiums and the puts. You're getting benefit from the fact that the underlying is coming closer to the put price, so the put premium increases, and it increases more than it should because of an increase in volatility. Wait for the down days to sell puts because you're gonna get these two beautiful benefits out of it. And what you want is you want a list of stocks ready on the side, this list of stocks where you say, I either own some of this and I don't mind owning more, or I don't own it and I don't mind, or, uh, and I don't mind having to buy it. If it's put to me, I'll use it to build my position. So I have ABR, ARRO, 
RWT, Redwood Trust, TWO, NRZ, IRM, which is Iron Mountain uh, Agency. This is I trade as a pair, uh, which is Simon Property Group and Taubman uh, Malls, and I'll explain why I trade that as a pair shortly. And then I have a Canadian uh, REIT that I want to accumulate uh, shares on HR. And for this one, I'm looking to get anywhere from 25 to 30,000 shares. Uh, and I'm going to do it by selling puts. Uh, I'm not actually going to physically buy it. I'm going to do it by selling puts because I'm going to earn a whole bunch of premium for uh, it not being put to me. Uh, and of course, I'm at some point it's going to be put to me because I'm selling a combination of in the money puts and out of the money puts. So here's what I do. Let's just take ABR for uh, example. It's uh, 950, I think, to 960 right now in the in the uh, high nines. And it responds to down days. When there's a down day, ABR really comes down, which is nice. So when ABR starts pushing the nines and getting into the eights, I look at the 750s. I look at the premiums there. I want to sell the 750s and the fives as a pair. I want to sell puts on both because it's not getting the five. I have a very firm belief that it's not getting to five. And if it ever got below five, I would want to load up on it anyways. Uh, why do I sell the 750s and the fives? Is because there's not enough premium on the 750s. I want to add the premiums of the fives to it. So I may sell uh, 30 puts at 750 and another 30 uh, at the fives. I may get, uh, uh, let's say, 80 cents here and I may only get 25 cents here, but that's a dollar five. Uh, so if it gets put to me at 750, I got a dollar five. If it gets all the way under five, I would have loaded up anyways. So I've really just positioned myself for what I would have done anyways. Uh, so I do those two at the same time, but I wait. I'm not going to do it tomorrow. If tomorrow's an update, I'm not doing it. I'm waiting for a nice big red day. And on a big red day, when I see that, I start putting all my orders in for all the puts that I want. Uh, ARR, I'll sell at 750. O, I'll sell the 55s, the 50s, and the 45s. Redwood Trust, the 750s and the 5s, the same way I do with Arbor. Uh, TWO, the 4s and the 3s. I don't see it getting there, but it's beautiful premium to collect. NRZ, the 7s and the 6s. IRM, the 20s. Uh, I sold the 20s when it was 23. It ran all the way up to 30. It was just easy premium to make. I think it's somewhere around 26, 27 right now. Uh, agency, this thing here, I'm going to keep on playing. It's just a beautiful thing to earn money on. I'll sell the 13s, the 1250s, and the 12s. I don't mind it being put to me. Uh, all my options expired on Friday. Nothing got put to me. Uh, across all the accounts because uh, uh, I have, you know, TFSA tax-free accounts. I have a, a, a Lira, an RSP, and of course the ugly one, the taxable account where you got to pay taxes. Um, HR, which is a Canadian REIT, uh, is uh, selling, I think, um, mid-10s, low-10s. I'm selling the 12s and 11s because I want them put to me. So I can buy it at $10.50 or I can sell the $12 put for a buck ninety. Uh, that gives it to me for 1010. Uh, why wouldn't I do that? Why, why pay 1050 if I can pay 1010 by waiting by waiting 40 days? Now if it goes from 1050 up to 12, well I sold the $12 puts for a buck 90. I make a buck 90 on it anyways. I make the money on the upside anyways by selling it in the money put. So even if it started to go up, I don't say, oh, I should have bought it. I did. <laughs> I've got all that movement uh, uh, all the way up to $12 I get to make because I got a buck 90 for it. So I'll sell the 12s, 11s, 10s, and 9s. Uh, so if Monday is a big ugly day and Canadian REITs are down and HR pushes into 960, 950, uh, I'll sell the 11s, the 10s, and the 9s. The 11s because it's in the money and I want to collect a, a, a position anyways. I'll sell the 10s and I'll sell the 9s which are out of the money. This is near at the money. And I'll sell three at a time. Uh, so if they get put to me at 10, well, I've got uh, the 11s put to me, the 10s put to me, and I got free premium on the 9s that offset the cost uh, on the 10s. If they go below 9, beautiful. That's probably where I'd load up and I'd probably go out to the next month and heavily sell the 9s uh, and, and maybe some of the 10s. Let me talk about Simon Property Group and, and, and Taubman. Simon Property Group agreed to buy Taubman. I think it was for fifty two fifty a share. Uh, and has since said, eh, we don't want to do it anymore. We, we changed our mind. Well, they got to go to court uh, to get out of this deal because it's it's a contract. I mean, it's a done deal. It's a contract. So they actually have to go to court and argue to a judge why they should be let out. And they're saying, well, it's because Taubman didn't do everything it could uh, to protect its rents and to protect uh, its, its revenue stream. That's going to be 
That's going to be hard to do. Uh, and there are experts in this uh, in this field looking at this merger saying that that you know for the time that they've been in it they don't see a way out that it's probably going to happen uh, it's just they're maybe they're just trying to negotiate a better price than 5250 you know I mean if you can wave lawyers around and try to get it down to 50 bucks why not so what I've done for, for TCO because it's around thirty six dollars is I've gone out to December and I sold the thirty dollar puts. Uh, and I got uh, 575 for that. And if it gets put to me, uh, my cost is 24.75. I'll own that company for 24.75. A malls. It has a malls. Uh, um, so if something disappears, it'll be replaced very quickly because they have super, super high traffic flow. They're not going away. The, the, the mall is not just a place to buy stuff. It is a social destination. It's not going away. Uh, as much as people think everyone's going to buy online, no. Uh, uh, there is a social aspect to this, and humans are social creatures. These are not going away. Uh, and Simon Property, uh, I'll sell the 50s every month. So I've got the 50s sold for July. Once they expire in July, I'll move and I'll sell the 50s for August, September, October, until the deal happens. I don't anticipate that either one will be put to me. I'm doing it just for the uh, premium that I collect. This is 575 so if you think about it monthly with six months to go, it's the same as selling uh, the $30 uh, put uh, for roughly about 95 cents a month, which is pretty much what you're going to get uh, on this one. And the longer it stays at 36, uh, the less and less likely you're going to get any premium on the downside. So once this was first announced, you make your assessment. I don't think that they're going to get out of this. Fine, let's go. Let's move forward and let's sell some puts because the premium is going to be super big on them. And uh, I'm already seeing that TCO... Uh, has barely moved from the time I sold the puts, and the puts are, uh, uh, you're not going to get 575 uh, selling the puts now. So I like that one. So what I'm doing is I have this ready to go, and I wait. And I'm not looking for a day where we're down 10 or 20 or 30 points. I'm looking for a blood red day, a day where we drop. Uh, where we're going into the close and we're hitting the lows into the close. I'm going to have my, my, my uh, limit orders on the puts that I want at the premiums that I want. Some will get hit, some won't. That's fine. I'm not going to chase anything. I let it come to me. That kind of selling, hopefully, if it falls into the next day, even beautiful, I'll increase my limit prices on, on, on the premiums and I'll wait for that to happen. If it doesn't, well, I already got some puts for the next day. If it starts to go up, okay, let's flip over to the other side. When do I want to do some call selling? That's the next screen. All right, so the market is up. And I feel I look at some of my uh, positions and I see that some of them are near the top of their trading range where they've been for the last three months. Uh, then you have to make an assessment. Does it look like there's going to be a breakout? Does it look like they're ready to move to a higher level? Or is this near the top of, of a range? Mortgage REITs are really easy to do this on because you have tangible uh, book value per share that you can use. Uh, I don't see mortgage REITs trading at a premium to tangible book value per share anytime soon. So I think they'll come up close to that price, but I don't see they'll trade at a premium. So I'm willing to sell calls at that price or a little bit higher. It's free money in my mind. I don't mind doing that. That's if I think I'm just at the top of a range. Markets can cycle and you can get to a top of a range. That's fine. Uh, you don't believe there's going to be a breakup, but you don't believe there's going to be a massive sell-off. Uh, if I think there's going to be a massive sell-off, I'll show you how I sell calls. But for now, this is what I'm going to do. Here's the top of the range. I'm going to sell a call above the top of the range. It's extra income. I do run the risk that if the stock does this, it is going to be called away from me. And if it's called away from me and I've held it for less than a year... Now I, have an, yeah, now I have income and I don't have a capital gain. I have a short-term capital gain. And depending on what tax jurisdiction you're in, it may be treated as normal income and not a taxable uh, and not a capital gain. That kind of sucks. So you want to be careful how you're playing, uh, playing those. Um, if, if I think the market is going to really sell off. Uh, so... Here's, here's a good example. We're going into, um, we've had a good week last week. We had a big sell-off and we recovered a bit. We're 31, uh, 31 and a half, 3140, 3130 uh, on the market right now. Uh, 3220, I think, was the high that we hit. I don't know that we're going to see that 3220 for a while in these markets. We could see it tomorrow. 
<laughs> That's the thing is, 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 is you can't forecast anymore. So all you can do is just say, if it gets here, this is what I'll do. If it gets here, this is what I'll do. But I'm certainly not positioning myself for a bull run or a bear, uh, a bear sell off because I have no clue. I have no clue. I'll trade the destination, not the beginning. Um, so maybe I have a belief uh, that we're a little bit toppy. Maybe tomorrow if the market is up, I'll see it as a good time to sell some calls on some certain stocks. Um, maybe uh, I might lighten up on one or two, maybe, especially the ones that don't have options that have really run to the top of their channel. If they don't have options, I might lighten up a little bit. Um, but let's say that I think that tomorrow the, the weight of all of these uh, virus cases are gonna start to weigh heavily uh, on the market that the fear of another shutdown is going to come in or that states are going to back out of the opening saying, okay, everybody, we, we're really just not ready for this. If, if the market, if I think that the market is going to start to price that in over the week, uh, I will uh, sell in the money calls, which means I'll sell my call down here. Uh, now it's already in the money and you have to do this very carefully. You have to make sure, like if this is your stock price and you're selling an in the money call, you have to make sure that the time value is greater than the upcoming dividend. Uh, reason is, is if the time value is less than the upcoming dividend, you're not going to be able to hold that call till expiration because it'll be called away from you because the other side will see it as beneficial for the dividend. So it can be a little bit risky in selling in the money calls because they could be called from you before the ex dividend date so you have to sort of time it uh, uh time it well um what you're when you sell a deep in the money call uh you're doing it for one of two reasons number one you do want to sell the stock but you want to get more for it than than the current market price right now you want to get a little bit more for it why not sell the deep in the money call for the next expiration date the other reason you're selling a deep in the money call is because you think that the stock price will be below that strike price by expiration date. You're thinking the market's going to do this. Uh, and if you think the market's going to do this, selling an in the money call makes a lot of sense. Why not just sell the stock? Why not just sell the stock? Why, why mess around with this? Why not just sell the stock and move to cash and buy it again at a cheaper price? Uh, I'm in this for the income. I want to hold the position because I want my income to be stable and growing over time. Selling stock and buying stock, my income is going to do this all the time. I'm going to do this. Uh, and what if I sell it uh, and it doesn't, it, and I'm wrong? Well, at least when I sell the call, I get a little bit more money for doing it. A little bit more. Uh, so that's why I sell the call. Uh, it allows me to hold on to a position that's paying me income. Uh, I get uh, from here to here, I get fully protected. So if the stock drops to there, well, guess what? The uh, premium I got for selling the call would have had that much money in it anyways because that's the intrinsic value. So even if it dropped, if I sell a $2 in the money call and the stock drops two bucks, I haven't lost a penny because I get to keep all that money from the call. I lost two bucks on the stock, but I made two bucks on the call. Do you get that? Uh, so, and, and during that period of time, I didn't have to sacrifice the cash flow stream because as the stock dropped, it doesn't change the dividend. The stock price doesn't change a company's dividend. It doesn't say, well, our, our stock price is down 10%, our dividend is down 10%. It doesn't work that way. So uh, if it did this big drop, well, guess what? My calls are making money and I'm selling puts. Beautiful, right? So that if it does recover, well, I've sold the puts. Well, those puts are going to make me money. Uh, and the stock will be called away from me because it's above the the, uh, the strike price. But chances are, as I was selling puts, I probably would have covered my call position at the same time. So I don't trade in and out of the shares all the time, but I'll trade in and out of the, stock, uh, the calls and the puts. I look for um, dividend yields somewhere between five and six percent on my equity positions. Five and six percent dividend yields, and I will sell calls and puts. The premiums I look for per month, uh, somewhere between uh, fifty and sixty basis points per month. I, I'd say even as low as forty-five basis points, because sometimes fifty is still a stretch. But if you target fifty basis points a month, that's six percent a year. Dividend range five to six percent. Add another six percent uh, from selling uh, the um, from selling the the options, 
uh, you're sitting at 12% even if your stock price doesn't move. Uh, in an uptrending market, REITs will typically grow five, anywhere five, six, seven percent per year. It is not unrealistic to earn 20% as an expert in a particular sector uh, by using the by using the options and the underlying stock. The more you get to know, 20% is not unrealistic. Uh, if if there are more professional traders out there who say no, that's simply not possible. I'll show you 10 years. I can yeah, I can show you the last 10 years. Uh, of history of what my time weighted return is, uh, uh, and uh, it is it's over twenty percent in each each and every year, regardless of what the market is doing. Uh, market is not fully recovered from from its high position, but when it drops like this, that's that's where experience makes a lot of money. That's where inexperience loses money, and that's where experience makes a lot of money. My portfolio value right now is higher than it was before the drop, even though we're nowhere near. I shouldn't say nowhere near, even though we're not above the highs. And the REIT sector is nowhere near where it used to be. I'm still above simply because all of those put premiums, all of those put premiums were beautiful. If you have the education behind you, if you understand the securities that you're trading, if you take the time to invest in your education, it will save you a lot of money in gaining experience. If you focus your energy on one sector and get to know that sector well, you will spot opportunity in a lot of places you otherwise wouldn't have seen it. If you go passively on a whole bunch of other trends, you're gonna get diversification out of that. And these ETFs have options. So you can bring that strategy of active option management in the sector that you're good at to those ETFs as well. If you feel, I'd like to get this ETF, well, why not sell some puts on it first, just to experiment, just to play, see what happens. Um, this is a business like any other business. If you treat it like a business, you can grow your business over time. Any business you're going to open is going to require an investment of capital. Think of this like an investment of capital. Uh, and any business that you open, you're going to learn about it. You're going to learn about the industry, who are the suppliers, who are your competitors, what are they selling for, what are their prices, same thing. Treat it like a business and you're going to grow your business over time. Uh, most businesses that you open, if you spend 100000 to open a business, it's two, three years before the owner is, is at a level where they can start to begin to take a salary that compensates them for the work. The first six months of a business, you're not paying yourself 100 grand a year, 200 grand a year. Why do you think you can do that in the market? Uh, why do you think you can open up a $5,000 account and in six months you're gonna have 50,000? Not gonna happen. Now you may say, oh, but uh, there's this person over here. I read a story that they started with 2,000 and now they've got uh, 3 million. Um, okay, there's one. Out of the tens of millions that try this every year, that's the best you got? One? Uh, I could show you one lottery winner every single week. Does that mean that you should take all of your money and go buy lottery tickets because you can spot one lottery winner? In, in anything you do, there'll always be one that, that, that you think, wow, I could be like that. What you're missing is they're not, they're not showing you a picture of all the people at the other end who, who got destroyed by this, who lost everything if they had. Well, here's one that really, really made it. Here's 13 million that didn't. Uh, and, and here's a whole bunch of horror stories from people who pretty much lost everything because they thought this was a game. Uh, treat it like a business. Treat it like a business. You're, you're, you're going to understand the business that you're in. You're going to understand the competitors. You're going to understand the sector. Uh, you're going to focus all your energy on becoming an expert there. And here's the beautiful thing about that. 20 years later, 30 years later, you're such an expert in this sector that you can now sell your expertise to other funds. You can uh, create a uh, weekly letter uh, to other funds, spotting what you think are the trends in that industry. That's, that's basically what uh, experts do in a particular domain is they set up their own little research firm and now they sell research in that particular sector. You can sell your experience and expertise later on, but you first must get it. Uh, I hope that helped uh, in terms of how to think about how to approach this. You can take the structure provided by the content at all three levels of CFAI and bring it to the retail space. 
And bringing that kind of discipline to the retail space is deadly, wicked. Um, you can do very, very well. It's an alternative to thinking about, well, there's only the institutional space. And for all the retail traders out there uh, who have sat through this all the way through without writing nasty comments, <laughs> nasty comments below about uh, what you agree with or disagree with, uh, if you made it all the way to the end, I strongly encourage you uh, to take some of these tips for uh, uh, away with you. Uh, try not to be everywhere. If you don't understand a security, don't trade it. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. Get the experience first. Save yourself uh, uh, the, the cost of the tuition of life because it can be really expensive. Um, I'll wrap it there.